Five minutes after 10, welcome back to the Eusebius Makaiser Show with me, Sizu Mpofu Walsh, with you still for today and tomorrow before the man, the legend that is Eusebius Makaiser returns on Monday morning and I can take my seat as a listener instead of having to prepare these shows early in the morning. The South African Communist Party is always at the center of the political, social and economic theater that plays out in our country every day. And recently they've been characteristically vocal in their critique of various things going on in our country, whether that be racism, corruption, or just general questions of economic policy. Now, I'm extremely excited for the next hour to be joined by the Deputy Secretary General of the, one of the Deputy uh, Secretary Generals of the South African Communist Party, Soli Mapaila, who has taken time out of his busy schedule of international travel and and domestic political statements to join us. Ntate Mapaila, thank you so much for chilling with us for the next hour. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sizwe, and uh, good morning to our listeners. I want to get right into it because there is so much happening and your position on a number of issues has reached the headlines in many ways. Let's begin, though, with a bit of a broader question about the transition in our country from the Zuma era to this era. You were an extremely vocal critic of the Zuma presidency towards the end. I was watching some videos yesterday and I actually couldn't believe some of the things you were saying. I'm sure you made <laughs> many people very angry. Um, we transitioned from that leadership within the alliance to the new era. How do you think this new moment of transition is living up to your expectations given uh, the old era that's just gone? Well, one can say we are at an interregnum uh, in a sense that um, we we have transitioned with uh, good intentions and we have put uh, concrete uh, measures, but we haven't really come out of the woods yet. Um, there was a massive uh, crackdown against corruption, uh, restructuring at the NPA, um, in many other areas at SARS, for instance, the, through the commission, the Nigerian Commission, uh, we now have the Zondo Commission, which is also dealing with issues of crime, uh, corruption, and mm. state capture. Um, there was intervention uh, at ESCOM, which was quite critical, um, which managed somehow to stabilize uh, us, but we haven't really attended to the crisis. So mm. we, we, we managed to stabilize, which was important. And I think that uh, that's why we, one can say we are at an interregnum, but we are quite clear about where we need to go uh, going forward. Mm. Um, so for that reason, wha- that's why we felt that uh, we needed also to confront the fight back campaign, which sought to uh, reject our coming up and and uh, basically also to reverse some of the gains that uh, the immediate measures that uh, the current president, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, had initiated uh, since he took office. You know, I wanted to just ask you as well, just on a personal level as well, because, you know, I think both in the media and with politicians or people who occupy political spaces, we don't spend enough time on the personal. And, you know, that era, particularly the 2017, the year of 2017 for you must have been a lot. You know, there were allegations of threats on your life. You were taking public positions against the leader of the alliance, which you form part. What was that like for you? Well, it's never a nice uh, uh, feeling or period to find yourself in uh, where you are threatened, um, particularly by leadership in the democratic government. And I think it was a very disappointing period um, Hmm. for one personally, uh, largely also when uh, some of our comrades, irrespective of the wrongs that were happening, took sides uh, blindly, uh, if you like, dog loyally to the leadership and they were not able to interface with the issues. Um, that also showed the regress in the consciousness of the revolution. And I think uh, we came out of that um, through the support of many people, uh, including across broad political spectrum, who stood up for the truth, and we confronted uh, um, the dictatorship, if you like, as well as uh, the abuse of uh, state organs, particularly security organs. Uh, for instance, we confronted uh, also, the abuse of new instruments of communications, the media. Um, you remember the the 
uh, Potinja uh, project mm. uh, that was also defeated. So all of that, uh, uh, the Bell Potinja project, all of that you could see that it was uh, cohesively uh, organized and it was quite strong and uh, the sometimes public opinion um, was quite um, very hard. Um, and it was much more aligned with uh, the authorities in government because mm. they had a massive say. That is why it's important that now um, the party has also launched a campaign together with other civil society organizations to defend our democracy and to defend our constitution. As you know, uh, right in 2017, we galvanized all uh, sections of our society. We convened uh, a national imbizo uh, in Beachwood, uh, people from across a political spectrum, um, the churches uh, and so forth to basically defend our constitutionalism uh, whilst appreciating the challenges that we face uh, as, as, as a country. So if you like, um, the personal was largely as a consequence of the politics and it was largely carried by the political mm. movement as well. Do you think that in the under the new leadership, the abuse of state institutions for political ends has abated in a way that is tangible or do you still think that there's a long way to go in terms of moving away from using state institutions for political ends well we haven't seen any demonstration of the abuse but a state organs uh, is the present is not for instance the state organs and we have seen for instance many uh, people inside various uh, particular security organs abusing that power um, uh, in order to please the leader. Mm. And I think uh, that's where we need to still mo do more work, for instance, to clean up the system. For instance, um, if you look at the change of leadership in the security cluster, uh, even after the interventions through um, um, a panel review on the uh, um, state security uh, intelligence or, uh, in institutions, mm. um, it dealt largely with the top layer leadership, but the operatives, the people who carried all this task and so forth, we had developed an ideology uh, or a thinking, a pattern. Uh, they still continue to do so. Mm. So that is why um, I think it will take some little bit of a time uh, to really turn, turn around uh, or turn the corner on this one. But um, we haven't really as yet seen uh, that acute uh, mm. a, a abuse of power. But to the extent that uh, the president has inherited almost... Uh, a very, um, if you like, uh, state with uh, rotten elements and who are still active, mm. we still have to remain vigilant. And I think we uh, would have seen, for instance, um, uh, how some action is not taken, for instance, whether it's uh, issues that are arises or issues that uh, may arise at the uh, Zondo Commission, for instance, which ideally those who were, who were in the state institutions, uh, particularly the security cluster, uh, could actually immediately uh, spring into action. Mm. And I can tell you that mm. if it was against the people that they know they don't like, they would have really sprung into action immediately. Mm. So we still have those rich residues, but I think um, they will be resolved as long as the masses are vigilant and they are able to stand up for their rights. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about just what that transition was like. Um, obviously a difficult period for you personally, but also for the broader Tripartite Alliance Politically, let's come into some of the issues that are going on around us now. And I'm, I'm, it's actually an auspicious time to have you here because Treasury recently released uh, <laughs> um, a discussion document. Um, so we used to have cabinet reshuffles late at night. Now we have discussion <laughs> documents every the, midnight. The, the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are your views on this discussion document? Well, firstly, we will have a comprehensive response to what um, the, um, the minister had released okay. and, and through the Treasury. Uh, as the Communist Party, we are even augmented Central Committee next week, um, which brings together all our district secretaries and expanded layer of provincial leadership um, that, that will allow us in enough time, for instance, to respond comprehensively. Uh, but we should say... Uh, on the one hand, that we are quite worried about the manner in which the document was introduced because it seeks to deal with policy issues 
and we feel that uh, it's important that the minister as well as the people in the treasury must understand that uh, we participated in the elections. We won the elections as a political party, a political movement, but elected on an, on a ballot mm. uh, through the ANC, and that is the mandating party policy-wise. So that any department can't wake up overnight and, and decide to issue a policy directive. And we are much more worried, particularly because of um, the current economic challenges that we face. Mm. And we think that um, people are aware that we are quite vulnerable because all of us are, are seeking for immediate and, and, and perhaps uh, very successful solutions. And we, we, we haven't found those. But we feel that if it still anchors us in a neoliberal uh, trajectory, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a strategic error um, and um, it will not be a, a solution for the crisis that we, we face as a country, uh, the deepening poverty, for instance, a massive unemployment, and therefore the inequalities that are, are, are have been replicated in the country, which are actually making many people to question the democratic dispensation itself, whether it was worth it to, to live this way. Mm. So we, we therefore felt that such an intervention will require proper engagement inside the party because we need to defend the actions of government as the uh, uh, as part of the ruling alliance and we can't do so mm. if for instance things are imposed on us we do not know about them. were you consulted about the release of a discussion document no no no, no, no. we're not consulted um, what we did uh, know was the fact that um, the comrades in government were preparing some documents which were obviously were supposed to, 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 to be brought to us uh, for engagement because mm. where they are located in government, they are able to deal with all integrities and therefore they can also bring uh, to, uh, to the fore the blind sides that we can see mm. and therefore we should be able to discuss that. But n nothing of that sort has happened. In fact, even the ANC itself um, the head of economic uh, policy of the ANC hasn't seen the document. Only hmm. when it was released, it was able to, to be shared a copy or something like that. But we haven't seen it before. Wow. So even the, even the ANC wasn't aware of, of this document? Well, as or, far as uh, hmm. m I, when I checked with uh, Comrade Kotongwana, um, why they, they, they did not involve us hmm. in this process, hmm. he said, no, he, wasn't, uh, he hasn't seen it himself. Um, so that means... Uh, the ANC itself wasn't uh, properly consulted on this uh, on this mm. matter, mm. but we do need an intervention on the economic side. And uh, in fact, sure. last week we had an al al bilateral meetings with uh, the ANC as well as with COSATO as the SACP. Okay. And in all those meetings, we put on the table the immediacy of the alliance uh, to discuss the economic situation facing the country. And uh, we've all agreed that we should be convening uh, quite soon the meeting of the Alliance Political Council uh, that will also prepare a, an alliance a, a summit uh, which must uh, finalize major economic interventions. Um, and I don't think uh, uh, this, uh, what, what was released as, as far as I've seen it, um, could be the one that uh, can can actually mm. provide uh, strategic solutions that uh, of the challenges that we face today. Mm. Well, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put this to you um, just because I I understand the delicacy of of obviously this just came out you know just the night before last and in some ways you want unity within this alliance particularly because this is a, a very divided moment but it may be that on the one hand there are two questions about clean government and then economic policy. And there may be a tension between your support for a particular group in the ANC that is caring more or that, that has demonstrated a commitment to clean government, but their economic policy commitments may be at odds with some of your ideological underpinnings. Do you think that tension is real? <laughs> yeah, you are right. Um, you have captured it well. I think, um, and I think that's 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 one important area that we are all committed to fighting corruption and for a clean government. Mm. And I think uh, President Ramaphosa has demonstrated his ability to do that. And Comrade Tito is one of those that uh, have also led uh, that intervention. For instance, you'll remember he released uh, uh, some regulation regarding cutting the frills in government. Uh, in order to 
uh, enhance um, whether it's uh, issues of efficiency mm. or savings uh, that should accrue to the general public and uh, service provision uh, by government. So we have welcomed uh, those kind of interventions, for instance, which we felt are, were, were important. Mm. Um, on the one hand, it doesn't mean we should keep quiet when an ideological trajectory that doesn't take us out of the morass that we face mm. today. Out I of mean, out of nowhere, I might add. Yeah, yeah, of course, because the capital system uh, is effectively in crisis internationally, and it continues to be in crisis. It has never uh, lifted us out of uh, the crisis that we, we are faced here, and we think that um, bringing in or anchoring the new trajectory on such um, a neoliberal posture will basically if you like cosmetic uh, a change the the impact will be the same that means uh, five years down the line we'll still be facing similar challenges mm. uh, we would have just done something different and the, the, the problem will still be there and that is why we, we, we require um, a much more uh, role of the public sector in fact the building of a productive public sector economy hence our focus on making sure that we rebuild state-owned enterprises and make sure that uh, they are e effective and they are able to respond as developmental tools in the hands of government because the private sector has over the years not responded to the national challenges. They have only uh, intervened on areas where they mm. will make profit. And I think um, uh, that's the logic that those who are in government have to appreciate. On the one hand, We've also seen, for instance, that uh, in some instances, people have looked uh, uh, argued about the efficiency of the private sector. And we've seen in many instances where even the private sector has not been efficient. All what we need to do is to make sure that the state sector, the public sector particularly, uh, not state uh, per se, but the public sector, it's effectively uh, managed, it's efficient. Hence, for instance, you have also heard us talking uh, in engaging the public sector unions and we have convened, we are convening a meeting with them. We have also uh, reported this matter to COSATO, not necessarily that we wanted a permission, but to say to them, we'll want to engage with the public sector unions, for instance, about the efficiency of government. And we'll want uh, our people, when they go to any public uh, service, to feel the proud uh, 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 of being mm. served by mm. members, for instance, of the progressive trade union movement well, who are on the other side I, of, of uh, mm. uh, service provision. Can I ask you on that? Because... Again, in this moment, and I quite like how you put it, of of kind of being between one phase and another. Um, you thought quite deeply about breaking away and contesting elections on your own. You then decided to come back into the fold, support the ANC's campaign. And of course, uh, a number of your members are also in some strategic positions within the state. Where are you standing right now on how you feel your views are being represented within the state and have you completely abandoned this this um, idea that you may have to break away if those or, or at least contest if if those views are not taken seriously? Well, um, firstly, our members in government are largely responsible for the implementation of the ANC policy. So we participate in the crafting of that policy through uh, the manifesto process where we are broadly involved in its crafting. And we expect all, all of them to implement the manifesto. But the, the ANC manifesto is not a socialist manifesto. So uh, somehow it, it's, it's a hard ask for us to prepare I expect them to implement socialism, uh, for instance, uh, under the current dispensation. Well, my other question on that then would also be, is the manifesto itself being implemented? Because it seems like there are some points in the manifesto that are currently being ignored or at least postponed. Yeah, that's that that that's a question that I think we can we can deal with. It's it's just beyond the manifesto. It's also about mm. the broad resolutions of the movement. Um, there are even some of the resolutions from Rogor Conference, for instance, that are not yet been implemented. <laughs> uh, and I, 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 as you know, for instance, there's this outcry sometimes even by elements in the fight back campaign that uh, President Ramaphosa is not being implemented in the Nasrek resolution. Mm. But if you can look into the Kabe Conference, uh, 1985. Uh, major resolutions uh, that were taken, 
uh, that are, have not yet been uh, implemented. So the implementation of resolutions, it's not a, one, a, a once-off process. In any case, um, NASREC uh, conference was just about two and a half years ago. So we expect our comrades to make sure that they implement projects that will have catalytic impact on the, on the society as a whole or on the programs of government. And we expect our, our CADAS uh, party comrades who are in government to lead by example, including in the fight against corruption and in dealing with issues that affect uh, the working class. But to that extent, we're having um, a discussion, uh, even uh, for next week we've uh, developed a discussion document where we'll be discussing with our district as we prepare for our special national congress in December, which will finalize or take a final position on this matter of whether uh, we should contest elections on our own or not. As you know, we did uh, contest elections in um, in Metzimaholu, mm. um, and uh, just yesterday there were elections in. Uh, Man- did Man- actually Man- quite well. It's mm. it's not easy to get that kind of electoral support in such short uh, yeah, in, in such Man- a short Man- uh, Our comrades in the Free State Province mm. did uh, alert us that they will find it difficult to go there and campaign on the side of the ANC. Hmm. Uh, in fact, they didn't participate in the in the in the campaign effectively, mm. and we did raise these matters with the ANC because of the challenges there. For instance, the level of corruption, the stance that those comrades uh, took, mm. who were ultimately expelled. Um, but because we haven't finalized uh, this matter, um, we we also respected them when they said uh, it would be difficult for them to go and and and, and participate in the campaign. And as you know, uh, out of the sixteen. Those uh, independent candidates were all members of the ANC, uh, got about 10 seats. Um, but it's something that the ANC must reflect on, the alliance must reflect on about how we treat uh, our comrades in government or deployed in government, particularly those who have a posture to fight against corruption, how we punish them, for instance, like in this instance. And I think um, one of the early issues we observed uh, when we were uh, looking at uh, Maluti Apufum yesterday was the general out uh, um, um, the, the the way in which the people responded to the vote? In fact, the people were thinking that the the entire municipality is uh, under the vote, and to the extent of the feelings, if uh, that was the case, we certainly would not have won the vote. Mm. So it's important that we have to reflect deeply as a movement about some of these challenges and the concerns raised by our comrades, as well as the uh, 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 communities. That Maluta Pufung uh, area, for instance, has suffered a great deal. And it's an area that cannot be neglected. We have been there doing the political work. Um, the people have almost given up on our movement because of the ill treatment that uh, they've endured. Right. We're in conversation with Deputy General Secretary of the South African Communist Party, um, Soli Mapaila. We're talking about what the transition from one leadership to another has been like, and now coming on to a number of current questions and getting a deeper sense of the SACP's view on what's going on around us from the recent Treasury discussion document to questions of political participation in elections. And we'll come back after this with even more contemporary questions, which we'll put to Mr. Mapaila. Thanks so much for sticking with us. We're going to run to the headlines And after that, we'll be back with more of this conversation. Hope you call in on 011-883-0702. Would be great to get your views as well. 25 minutes to 11. Welcome back. I'm Cizu Mpofu Walsh. Welcome back to the Eusebius Makaiser Show. We're in conversation for this hour with First Deputy General Secretary of the South African Communist Party, Mr. Solima Paila. We've been talking about all that's going on around and getting the SACP's views on that. And we have Mushere on the line now who'd like to join the discussion. Welcome, Mushere. Yes, Susan Soli. Mm. I have a problem with the ANC and SACP and the, 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 this the, the joining together of these political parties. If you look, after Nazareth, ANC has taken a policy position when pertaining to the issue of treasury and how they're going to turn around the, the, the economy. 
before testing whatever that they've agreed upon during Nasrek, DP is already taking out something that he want people to comment on. When are they going to action whatever that they've agreed upon during Nasrek? Are they just want us to co- continue discussing issues without implementing whatever that is already on hand? Are they failing to really take us off the situation that we are as a country? Hmm. Thanks, Mashiri, for that call. Yes. Let's also go to Rob in Kensington. Rob, welcome. Good day, uh, mm. uh, Just uh, and uh, Mr. Mapaila. Just yes. to uh, uh, add on to what Mishere said, there are too many meetings after meetings. It's time for action, Mr. Mapaila. How many meetings do you have every week about the economy, about everything? It's time for action. Less talk and more action. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, Mr. Mapaila, your response to those callers? I fully agree with them about action. Um, we we are all committed to action. I think what is important is that we should also know what are we actioning. And that is why, um, because the political party is the one that takes uh, the responsibility um, w- of uh, how government runs. And therefore, people in government can't just do as they please mm. uh, without the mandate of the party. Yeah. And I think uh, that's only fair that uh, the, the political party in charge uh, should actually have a say and give directive so that it can account for its own failures. So we, we fully agree with that. And I think um, even that, that's the main focus of uh, the president implementation, implementation, implementation. But it should be implementation of things that will work, of things that will turn around the situation that we have all seen, particularly when we went across the country during the elections period, which accorded us an opportunity to visit uh, in a short period of time almost all corners of the country. And these are the issues that we have also said. Um, whatever action that we put in place should directly respond to these challenges. And and, and uh, so we, we agree with them. Then there's no doubt about it. And I, I, don't, I don't think that even our intervention seeks to to delay an intervention. We have also ourselves said that uh, any postponement of interventions um, um, is is too negligent, uh, gross negligence, if you like, in a sense that what we've seen on the ground, the people are in dire straits, uh, they they cannot postpone any longer their hunger or being sick and so forth. So the intervention is as yesterday. And that's why in other areas, for instance, there's been rollout of uh, the national health insurance, which, by the way, the capitalist forces uh, arraigned themselves against this important project. And we had to establish a new front uh, together with the minister to defend uh, this intervention on uh, by access to, to health by all South Africans. So I want to come to another urgent political question at the moment um, related to some of those calls and comments, which is, This framing that you have joined, which suggests a a fight back campaign. And I think in many ways, the theme of the last few years and probably the next few years is is it seems this battle within the alliance, within ANC politics of one group, maybe on the way out, but fighting to retain power and authority within the ANC and another group trying to become, but maybe not yet being born, as you say. Take us through why you frame this fight, gap, uh, fight back campaign in that way and, and who do you think is, is part of this fight back campaign and what's the evidence that this campaign exists and is coordinated? Firstly, you would have noticed that uh, we there's been a massive response on... The, the project that the president has launched, particularly in the fight against corruption. There's been a coordinated attack on the Nigent Commission and its findings uh, on, on SAS, uh, South African Revenue Services, um, and, and set certain uh, people in the movement actually aligned themselves with that particular attack. There's also been an, an attack on the interventions uh, at ESCOM, um, as well as the Zondo Commission itself on uh, state capture, sure. to the extent that uh, people felt that it was targeted at, at them. President Zuma, former President Zuma himself, had indicated that uh, he feels this commission is uh, arraigned against him. Mm. When actually we called him, we called it when he was there. And in fact, we were the first to call for it. By the way, 
uh, before the public protector uh, uh, made uh, that uh, that ruling uh, to the extent that it needed to be established. But and at that time, we even said to him, establish this commission and set the terms of reference as, as president. And he delayed. And the good thing about uh, Advocate uh, Tulima Tonsela was that when she made the, uh, came to the same conclusion as us, she then said he must not be responsible to set up the commission, to mm. appoint the, uh, no, the head of the commission. There's so, no doubt that she played an important yeah, role so in the establishment. In that case, so all of these uh, forces that are against the, um, the, the interventions have then mopped themselves together into, into, if you like, a coalition of the corrupt to fight the, those who are fighting corruption in state institutions. That is why, for instance, uh, we want uh, when uh, there was a massive attack on uh, Comrade Pravin Gordon as Minister of uh, Public Enterprises for his interventions, particularly in state-owned enter enterprises and how they were run and how he, he led ministerial interventions, to the extent that he was singled out uh, with the sole intention to teach him a lesson and to teach others that if we deal with him, no one should dare touch us because we are so powerful. And we felt that uh, it would be unfair to leave him on his own. And we, we mopped uh, ourselves into a, a, a variety of organizations to fight and defend his rights and also to make sure that those who are fighting against corruption are protected uh, within the state system. But lastly to say, uh, there was a journalist or there is a journalist from the Sunday Times, uh, Kwanita, uh, um, who wrote about a meeting in Durban uh, which sought to undo certain things from uh, Nasrek. And if you look at... Um, and this was participated in by President Zuma as yes, well? Yes, 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 quite surely. Right, okay. If you look at uh, what's happening and what was reported then, there's massive correlation. So you believe there's a concerted attempt within the ANC and with other partners to actually reverse the outcomes of Nazareth? Not much the political outcomes um, in okay. terms of policies, but uh, much mm. more the leadership question. For instance, mm. to undermine uh, the leadership of uh, President Ramaphosa mm. um, and to make sure that uh, the major intention to deal with corruption mm. and state capture is defeated because people are fearing to go to mm. jail. Mm. And that is sure. why uh, even those from other parties, for instance, that would have mopped with, the, with, with these forces, mm. feel that uh, the success of this project will actually send them to jail. Hence, they've mopped together into a new campaign. That's why we felt that we needed to launch a mm. campaign now together with um, the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation. Uh, and of course, we've been now joined by many other organizations in defense of our democracy and to fight the fight back. And we're confronting the fight back. It's a new battleground with new threats as well. Uh, but we're not afraid we'll confront them and we'll win. And we think that South Africa will win and defend its um, democracy. Well, there are a lot of people within the ANC when you ask that question about is there really enough division that there are that there's a coordinated group within the ANC, maybe even led by previous leadership, to try and frustrate not necessarily the economic outcomes, but the political outcomes. They said, well, nah, not really. Unity is growing. Um, you know, the party is united. So do you think that that view is is actually wrong or, or misguided in terms of the internal politics of the ANC right now? It's not necessarily uh, wrong or misguided. I think um, the president himself has been the champion of, um, of unity and renewal uh, of the organization. But the people don't want the renewal aspect. They want to uh, remain on the unity platform. But uh, at the same time, they are launching attacks, uh, particularly on him, in order um, to disable him to be the champion uh, of the renewal project. Because they will then say, we are all tainted. And, and therefore, if we are all tainted, he will become powerless to act. You won't act against anyone because they'll simply say, why don't you act against yourself or against so-and-so? That is why we, we came in on a principle in this regard to say, irrespective of who is involved, uh, if you are found to uh, have stolen from the public, um, you must be dealt with, there must be accountability. And we are clear about that as the, as, the, as the Communist Party. And we have also felt that we needed to support those who are championing the fight against corruption.
Well, there's a complication in the fight back narrative from my perspective to the extent that it paints people who are in the same party as if they are somehow not in collaboration with each other. In the election, I saw President Ramaphosa joining arms with uh, Secretary General Esma Khashule. Um, nobody gave more political cover to President Jacob Zuma than President Ramaphosa in the 2012 period. Pravin Gaur- minister Pravin Gordhan was also a senior minister in, in the Zuma administration. So my question is, how can we trust people who, in many ways, formed part of the rot, who sat in those cabinet meetings, who saw all that was happening? And yes, they, they, they found their voices later, how can we trust that they really are committed to this cleanup and will not revert back to unity like they did previously? Yeah, that's a very important point. I think the first one relates to, firstly, that because people are elected uh, by the organization, they are elected not because they are friends or, or buddies, uh, and they are bound to work with each other. Uh, it's not a choice. It's the Congress decides. Sure. But in cabinet, I can say that um, I don't think uh, there would have been a cabinet that took a decision, uh, a corrupt decision. Um, the corruption would have happened um, in processes. When a matter comes to cabinet, a particular minister or through his DG or, or, or her DG will actually uh, prove the fact that we have followed a, uh, the necessary process. So cabinet will approve things on the basis that uh, ministers who have taken oath uh, to the uh, allegiance of office to the executive and the, and the country. Um, so it will, it will not be a minister who says, yeah, we're taking this decision corruptly. But it's what happens behind the scene uh, before issues are processed. If you like, um, sometimes it's, it's difficult to see what I may characterize as controlled corruption. Uh, where, for instance, uh, things pass through the normal processes, but they've been corrupted. They even pass through uh, the due diligence of um, um, uh, ca- companies like uh, KPMG, for instance, mm. which are supposed to look into the nitty-gritties of those things. And so a minister in a, in a, in a formal meeting won't necessarily participate or, 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 or see that. But when it became obvious that certain things were being done wrongly. Those ministers took a stand. Uh, Bladen Zeman was one of those. He was ultimately removed. Uh, Pravin Godan and so forth, who was also removed and brought back, and several others, and Tlantla Nene and, and several others. It so wasn't they, obvious by, by 2012? No, 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 no. no. I, I don't think uh, by then it was. I think post-2012, um, we've seen a bullish uh, presidency. Um, I think at the time, President Zuma was aware that uh, he's leaving office. He needed to amass as much as, as, as he can. And it is during that time that um, we also began to, 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 on, to warn him about the conduct of the Guptas, what they were saying, um, and what we're seeing uh, as the response of government. And o- obviously, initially, it didn't click that uh, something of that massive uh, was being coordinated. But the Zondo Commission has um, proved to us and, and laid bare um, more than what we thought was happening. And I think now South Africa is aware about what's happening. Now we can hold everybody uh, accountable. Uh, ministers are aware that they have been looked into and so forth. We're in conversation with First Deputy General Secretary, Mr. Soli Mapaila, and let's go to some of your calls. Lekhokonolo, uh, welcome to the show. Bro, Mr. Mapaila, yes, I, 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 I have a difficulty of understanding and following SACP's logic. Let me tell you why. Mm. Um, Right now, as we speak, bro, SACP is anti-capital, right? But the whole system of SACP is benefiting from capitalist economic setup. Let me give you an example. Right now, the cars you guys drive, the lifestyle that you guys lead, are in opposite of what you you, you, you claim to represent. Point number two, um, just clarify for me there as to how can we separate you from 
capitalist life that you're leading towards socialism that you're trying to, to, to I mean, you're claiming to, 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 okay. to, to want to leave. Okay, we number get you, Shogonolo. Num, n- number two, I want to understand, how can we separate President Ramaphosa from the Zuma rot, having been number two for almost four and a half years, and having led as, as, as a business leader? Okay, Mr. Gunola, we're going to leave it there. We we hear your your two questions. Um, one about this question of um, personal lifestyle versus the public. Um, I actually think you're an example of the opposite of that. Um, I think your personal lifestyle actually is quite quite in accordance with your politics. I don't know about everyone in in the SACP. Um, and then uh, again, this question of. Um, uh, of President Ramaphosa and our ability to trust um, the cleanup campaign? Well, I think firstly is that um, I've explained to the first, the first part about the collective leadership uh, mm. that was there. Um, regarding personal lifestyles, um, mm. the reality is that I don't know what Lithuanolo is trying to say. Uh, I, 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 quite certainly, I should not uh, distort him to say he wants us to use bicycles to do our work. <laughs> uh, and that a communist can't get into a plane, um, mm, mm. so that that will be a serious mistake. There are a lot of these funny uh, views uh, on social yeah, media yeah, yeah, as well yeah. that you have to live in poverty in order to even point out any injustice no, no, in our in country. In fact, uh, the whole intention of the socialist system is to end all poverty and exploitation of a human being by another human being. That's uh, that's our intention, and to make sure that uh, we 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 live in a. a as equals in society, including economically equal. So that's our intention. That we live in a, a capitalist society is not necessarily uh, our creation. That's why we, and is, we, 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 we can point out that at least over the last 200 years or so, Marxism has pointed out clearly the, 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 the root causes of social inequality emanating from the capitalist system. And we inherited as a democracy uh, um, a capitalist system. We have not changed that. So where should we live? Uh, because we should live. We should uh, live South Africa, because it's a capitalist society. We should. We we need to fight for socialism here, and make sure that the people. That's why when we introduce uh, the national health insurance, which by the way was championed by the Communist Party uh, for more than a decade. Mm. When we launch our public health campaign to make sure that all South Africans, irrespective of their status, should have equal access to the best health services the country can afford, mm. that's an element of socialism. So we fight for that as the Communist Party. And when the ANC accepts it, uh, the better. So we can't uh, be part of society and be free from it. At the same time, we have to, I agree with the part that we have to leave the mm. value system that is not opulent, um, that uh, assures the people that uh, even if we, we if uh, when we, we, we are to take power, mm. we will make sure that we roll out a social system that is equal. For instance, if you go to some of the socialist countries like Cuba, for instance, uh, immediately one thing you, 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 you realize is the egalitarianness of the, of the whole population. So if uh, leaders don't have certain things, even the ordinary people don't have. So, but at the moment, we have, we have inherited an, a society that is extremely unequal mm. based on a capitalist accumulation. And what we are fighting against now is the part of the liberators who have joined the primitive form of accumulation uh, themselves, uh, including mm. some rolled out by our government through the BEE schemes, for instance, mm. where we try to, to build capitalists uh, without capital. And, of <laughs> course, if we, when we analyzed that, we also found that um, over the last uh, 25 years, for instance, we spent more than 500 billion rent uh, through regulations to support BEE project, mm. but we spent less that amount on uh, education and, and housing. Hmm. You know, it actually brings me to an interesting just question again, personally, about your your life and your politics, because as you say, um, there are members and, and also of, of opposition parties as well that, that live more materialistic lives. Um, and there's a debate about that. But what does strike me about you and your politics is, is even in your personal life, you 
you take it seriously to be modest given the inequality in our society where did that come from and what kind of leaders did you observe that kind of made that accordance between your public and your personal um somewhat more consistent or at least why do you think that's important for your specific politics well i think the greatest task in uh, any revolutionary or aspirant revolutionary is um to try and live by example because the example is the greatest mobilizer uh, of the people so our party um and the movement as a whole that has been our intention that uh, there are deviations by individuals who may be so influential and people only judge us according to to those individuals um it's quite unfair um, and perhaps uh, even um, unfortunate uh, on the part of those members and the impact that they make on the movement but otherwise it, it's, it's our it's our task to make sure that um, we ground our movement we ground our people in fact uh, you know yesterday we had a meeting with uh, our comrades we have a, a funeral in the township of togoza and um one of our comrades uh, former mk combatant uh, um they've got a family uh, funeral and the comrades were worried about uh, the upgrade of the of the coffin hmm. and i had to step in and say but comrades is the upgrade of the coffin more important than the aftermath of the funeral mm. uh, to take care of the family so it is those kind of things and we have agreed as with the branch to come back and have a debate about this matters so it's important that we always have to come into that space to ground our movement to its uh, primary objectives mr soli mapaila first deputy general secretary of the south african communist party thank you so much for being so generous with your time and spending this hour with us thank you very much sir thanks for watching the content like share and subscribe on all platforms smwx.co.za to join the whatsapp channel and let's build a new conversation for a new generation are you are you